Hello, I'm Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Before becoming a New York Times bestselling author, and before he wrote 23 novels, James Grappando spent 12 years as a trial attorney. Well, for inspiration for this latest book, he didn't have to look any further than his home territory of South Florida. Cash Landing is the story of amateur thieves pulling off one of the biggest airport heists in history. And it really happened in Miami in 2005. Please welcome the author of Cash Landing, James Grappando. Thank you. I have to tell you, I loved the book. I do, I, I love what you write, but I loved, love this book. And when I started reading it, I kept having to con tell myself, convince myself, this really happened. <laughs> yeah, it's inspired by an actual story that happened in, in South Florida. I took some, some liberties as a novelist, because I don't write true crime. I write, uh, all of my 23 books have been novels. Um, so, uh, but the inspiration is there, and uh, certainly the twists and turns were there. Uh, but it's got a Grappando spin to it. It definitely has a Grappando spin. And, and when I'm reading it and thinking, you didn't make up the outline of this thing, it happened. Let's start really with some basics because there's things I didn't know. A money flight. Right. Tell me what is a money flight? Yeah, that was my reaction when I heard about it. When, uh, you know, as you can imagine, I get a lot of people come up to me all the time and say, I've got this great idea. All you've got to do is write it. Uh, and I know they know nothing about writing because writing isn't about the idea. It's about the discipline of sitting down and writing. So when a federal judge came to me, however, and said, I then have this listen. great idea, yes. <laughs> I listened. Uh, and he said, uh, well, you know about the money flights. And I said, no, I don't know anything. But I was intrigued. It sounds intriguing. But, and he says, well, you know, every, every Sunday afternoon, there's a Lufthansa flight coming in from Frankfurt. Uh, 747, and there's anywhere between 80 and 100 million dollars in the cargo belly of cash. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, why? He says, well, the German banks don't need all these 50 and 100 dollar bills, so they send them over to Miami, which is a very cash driven economy. And uh, the Federal Reserve is just four miles away from the airport there, so they it goes, the money goes through customs, is put in an armored car, and they take it straight to the Federal Reserve. We're talking American money. Exactly. 80 yes. to 100 million dollars right. of American bills. Right, right. Okay. Which is, you know, and when you're, a, you're a, an armored car driver uh, and you see this kind of money cash mm -hmm. passing through the airport and you start to think this is too good to be true, right? And that's exactly what happened that the judge told me about. And this is not just in the novel. This is this is the true story of what happened, was there was an armored car driver who worked for Brinks who brought the money from the airport, uh, from the, air, uh, from the uh, 747 to the warehouse where it has to clear customs. Um, and he noticed a few things. He noticed, um, number one, security cameras weren't working. Um, number two, uh, that um, the, the, uh, they had to open the bags in order for them to clear customs. So they would have to spread out the bags on the floor, and there were a lot of them, because each bag only holds $2 million. <laughs> so, so there's more than, you know, there's 40 some bags or more spread out on the floor, wide open. Um, and thirdly, he noticed that because he, as a uh, private security officer, was not a customs agent, he had to remove his weapon. So there was no one armed to watch the money. And then thirdly, or fourthly, the, uh, the most amazing thing to him of all was that the back door of the warehouse led to a perimeter road that led directly to the expressway, so it was an easy getaway. So that, those four factors got him to thinking, and uh, that was the, the, the genesis of the whole idea. I mean, there's, so. there is more security in your branch bank or in a 7-Eleven, it seemed like, that, than there would have been for this. Yeah, and kind of the amazing thing to think about is this is post in 9-11, too, right? This right. was 2005. The book is set in 2009 for reasons that drove this. It worked better for me, just, but the actual events were in 2005. And the way that was explained to me was that, especially in around 2005, 
the priority, budget-wise and every other wise, was about protecting people. It wasn't about protecting mm -hmm. cargo going through the airports. It was about the safety of passengers. Um, so this was somewhat of a neglected area. So here we have this money, just seems like it's ripe for the taking. And in the story and in real life, we have this gang of four. And they are the most peculiar four people to form an alliance. Let's start with who the fellow who I guess was the ringleader or assumed he was the leader, and that would be Reuben. Right. Yeah, I changed the name, but it's based on an actual guy who's now in jail. I'm not spoiling anything <laughs> by telling you that. Uh, but uh, he was a close friend with the guy who worked for mm -hmm. Brinks. So the guy who worked for Brinks uh, security came to him and said, you know, exactly what I just told you. You know, these, this is too easy, too good to be true. And so Ruben, uh, the character Ruben, but the real life guy got together um, two other characters that sort of round out almost, it's almost comical, to be honest with you. And there is it a comical funny. component to it. I'm yes. sorry, it was funny. <laughs> so he gets his, bro his, his um, uncle, uh, who, and I didn't make, I kept this name the same because it's just too, too foolish to make up. His name is Pinky. Okay, so so the uncle Pinky and Pinky is, is despicable. Yeah, he's kind of a he's, he's not a, he's awful. not a nice guy, yeah. um, but he's not a high level thief. He's a two bit car thief basically, you know. And the other guy that he recruits is his uh, nearly four hundred pound brother in law, who's only five foot six inches tall. So uh, he's morbidly obese, and he's a cocaine addict, um, and he has a um, uh, a weak spot for strippers. So that's Jeffrey. That's, that's Jeffrey. So he's an actual. That that guy was um, inspired by the actual character. So that's the four of them. And, is, and uh, none of them are brain surgeons. No. But you got to no. give them some credit for thinking big. Yeah, they did think big, no doubt about it. But um, they didn't think it all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, um, you know, to this point of they had one gun among yeah. them. Uh, and their plan was to show up with a pickup truck uh, at the warehouse and grab as much loot as they could in about 90 seconds and then make a getaway, um, which sounds simple enough. Uh, and to their, their, to, much to, to their pleasant surprise, everything that had been told them about the weakness of the security was true. You know, they had to take off the weapons. The money was spread out on the floor. The back door led to the getaway. Uh, the security cameras were not working. So, you know, even though they weren't sophisticated criminals, they had to be at least heartened to know that it didn't take a whole lot to pull this off, except things sort of to un started to unravel when they realized how much a bag of money weighs. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's heavy, uh, and they're trying to grab, you know, one guy's holding the gun, trying to grab as much as he can. It's 40, 38 pounds, uh, each bag of cash. Um, so they managed to grab, there's, there's 88, in this case, there was $88 million on the floor. Um, they managed to get about almost $8 million, um, in the time they had allotted for themselves. They literally dropped bags on money, the concrete yeah. floor, spilling out on the floor as they're trying to make their getaway. They throw everything to the back of the pickup truck, and guess who's driving? A 400-pound Jeffrey, the cocaine <laughs> addict, is their driver. He's their getaway driver. Um, so they make their getaway, and they get away. That's sort of the amazing thing. That, Every, so so that far, so good. Really you know, right? surprised yeah. me. You said you said it in 2009 instead of 05, and part of that, I think, was because from Ruben's point of view, his house had been foreclosed on, right. which was certainly the right timing in, in there. Um, and he had a lot going on. He really, of all of them, he really needed the money. Right. There was a, um, yeah, I mean, it, one of the things I, I wanted to was to make him at least somewhat um, understand his motives. I couldn't understand the real life character's motives at all, other than greed, which made him not very interesting to read about. Um, you know, and, uh, and and some of the things that I put in the book were actually true. I mean, he was, uh, you know, he and his wife liked to go to a wife's 
flopping swingers club, you know, it, not an exactly an endearing kind of guy, you know, so, uh, and I used some of that in the story, but um, 2009 was a pretty tough time in South Florida. People's houses were getting foreclosed mm -hmm. on left and right, and so, and, and I think the way that you could justify this crime, and a lot of way a lot of criminals justify their crime is that they're just stealing from a bank, you know, and the bankers are trying to stick it to you all the time. And he was trying to get so, back at the bank. Yes, so the bank had taken his house, had taken his car, had taken literally everything but his motorcycle, and so uh, so uh, there was some understanding, the resentment and the and the sort of the get even mentality that was driving him from his point of view. Now go back to Jeffrey for a moment. This, the obese cocaine addict uh, brother of Ruben's wife, he manages to get himself kidnapped twice. Yeah, you know, and, and that's one of the <laughs> things that I, I kind of get a lot, a little bit of grief from. It's like, you know, come on. I mean, how am I supposed to believe that? Well, that's actually true. <laughs> uh, uh, the real life Jeffrey, um, basically, the way what happened. I said they got away. They got away for a little while. And their plan in the book, just as in real life, was to hide the money, bury the money, literally, bury it in the ground in PVC pipe and until everything sort of cooled down. Um, and they had this pact that they weren't going to spend any of the money. Well, Jeffrey, as you might imagine, you know, he went to what he likes, drugs, and women who like to take dance and take their clothes off. So he started buying twenty thousand dollar Rolexes for uh, strippers, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, this guy who had nothing, who you know, uh -huh. suddenly is buying twenty thousand, forty thousand dollar Rolexes and buying cocaine for the house, uh, you know, for everyone at the strip club, and uh, he became sort of conspicuous. A little bit. <laughs> uh, um, but not just to the FBI. He also became very conspicuous to other criminals. And so Jeffrey um, was kidnapped uh, as he's kidnapped in the story. And I'm not, again, I'm not giving away anything about the book. It's really about just... It's like watching this train wreck you can't w take your eyes off of, right? You know, so no, basically I don't like to a, spoil it for the audience yeah. or for anyone, but this, this no. has to be told. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all of this happens <laughs> very soon in the book, you know, so, and it's how it plays out afterward. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, and uh, in real life, I can tell you this much, that it, once they were all caught, um, the, the kidnappers are the ones who got the long prison sentences because they're bad guys. They were really bad guys and they knew Jeffrey and his gang were pretty much amateur thieves and you know sort of you know like food, shooting fish in a barrel basically. They got suddenly they've got all this money. They're doing really stupid things and they used Jeffrey as sort of the leverage to find out for one thing they didn't know that they only had $8 million. All they know is that this money flight comes in that has $88 million right. on it, right? So, um, so it, it got to be a really dangerous situation. You have it, I think, in true Grappando fashion where criminals are preying upon criminals. Right. I guess that happens, though. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, 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 uh, and that was one of the dilemmas for the FBI in this, was that how long did, because at some, you know, the FBI did, um, become aware of they they started targeting these things. Jeffrey sort of did some stupid things. Got the FBI following him, uh, and the question for, for the thing that the FBI wanted to make sure of is that they're going to recover all the money, number one, and number two, that they're going to find out the whole universe of people who's involved in this. So they want to let it play out a little bit. But when you've got really, really bad guys preying on the criminals, you, you can't let it play out till somebody gets killed, right? You know, that's just, um, uh, that, that, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't put the FBI in a very good light, basically. So, so it's a delicate thing they had to watch there. How much money was actually recovered? Yeah, not much. Uh, you oh. know, like a million dollars or something like that. Yeah, was recovered. Oh. So, um, and these guys are all up for parole in a couple of years. Um, 
which is one of the difficulties I had uh, in trying to, to gather, uh, you know, I do a lot of research for all my novels. Did you talk to them? Novels, Did so you go to? Tried to. I talked to their okay. lawyers. Uh, but their choice was, uh, look, they're up for parole. The last thing they need to do is, you know, start shooting their mouth to uh, a writer or a reporter and end up, you know, um, saying something that will land them, you know, keep them in prison longer. So, so no, I didn't. Uh, lawyer, you know, for example, the, the lawyer for Jeffrey told me that uh, he's probably the most naive guy he <laughs> ever met, you know, and, you know, and that's well. how he ended up getting kidnapped twice. That's how he, he got <laughs> snookered by, by, you know, strippers who ended up, you know, who lured him into this trap where he got kidnapped and so forth. So, there are so many angles. I mean, I know probably to the audience it sounds like, oh, well, he's giving away the whole book. Oh, no. <laughs> but, I mean, there are so many <laughs> twists to this. It's just, uh, uh, it's a story that almost wrote itself. Do you, if all this money is still out there, I see another book. I mean, do, do you want to follow this up? With yeah, I hadn't a, thought uh, about that. That's an interesting thought. Not but, that you yeah. need me to pitch yeah. you a book. As yeah. you said, you're, you know, right. you have enough people pitching stories to you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that, but I do think that there is going to be a story about this, and I'll be—I would—I would bet money that uh, the FBI will be watching these guys when they are released from oh, prison because I bet so. somebody's got a fair amount of money stashed away somewhere. I mean, I, they burned through a lot of it for sure. You know, I mean, you, there's only so many so many Rolexes you can buy for strippers, you know, and keep your <laughs> share of the money, you know. So. Um, so they burned through a lot of it, but uh, uh, there has to be some stashed away. In fact, I've, the FBI agent thinks probably. Miami is a character in this book, no question. I mean, yes, we know glitzy Miami, but you've got some seedy stuff in here too. Is it, I think it's the Gold Rush. Is that a real place? Is that was a real place. That's the, uh, the Gold Rush is the strip club. It, it's closed now, but that actually, and that's how I was able to use it. Um, I don't typically put, um, the streets were real. Yeah, you... the streets are real, but I never, I never put like, um, a restaurant or a club or something that actually exists, especially if a crime happens there. I shouldn't say never. I, I often put a restaurant in there if it's just a setting for a scene. And Restaurants love that, and I get lots of free bottles of wine cool. for that. You know, so it's like you know, so. Uh, but uh, but if there's going to be a crime happening there, people, you know, somebody getting shot, somebody, you know, stealing something, somebody doing drugs, something like that. I don't, I wouldn't pick a real place. But the Gold Rush, I picked as a real place because it's closed, so there's no damage that I can do. Did you have to, to the, do strip club research? You know, no, no. Okay. That's that was that, that was that was done in college. Okay. So that's done. You know, so yeah, yes. Yeah, so, uh. Now speaking of strange things, there is a club, and I use that term loosely. That pinky is hot to buy. Right, right. This now, I I don't consider myself naive, but then perhaps I am because this kind of wife swapping to the nth degree, yeah, um, yeah. swinging, whatever, however you want to call it. He was really involved in that. Yes. Um, now, uh, that's, that is, I changed a little bit in that story, but in the real life story, um, one of the, it was a character, but wasn't Pinky, uh, who was into the into that. wife okay. swapping. So they exist down here. I didn't know that, but I guess everything else exists here, so why wouldn't that exist here? So, okay. yeah, so, uh, <laughs> One thing about the money, it, it isn't marked. It, it isn't like a right. die pack went off in it. So I, I keep going back to when, when they get out of prison, they could spend it. It's 50s and 100s. Isn't yeah, it? that's the thing to the important, that's an important point too, because a lot of people wonder about that when they're reading this. These are not newly printed bills, you know, straight from the mint that are going to a bank and there would be a die pack in there or something. These are bills that have been in circulation and in, been in circulation in many cases so long that they've made it all the way to Europe. Uh, so uh -huh. they're in circulation in, in Europe, um, and then they're shipped back to us. And the intent is not to send them to an incinerator. They're not that used that they're in terrible condition. The intent is to put them back into circulation. So, um, yeah, so you've got, you don't even really have to launder them uh, the way you might. Uh, there's no... They don't record, you know, no, one's, no one sits down in Germany and, and records every okay. single serial number on, on these bills that comes through. That, that just doesn't happen. 
you know, yeah. I said in the beginning you were a trial lawyer for quite a few years before you started, well, before you became famous as a mm. writer. This has to be a lot more fun than writing a legal brief. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it also gets read by a lot okay. more people, so that's, <laughs> uh, that's, that's nice too. So, but yeah. the background, there are so many very good authors who, had a le who have legal backgrounds. Right, right, yeah, and I, th I think, um, you know, when I first, my first novel was called The Pardon. It was a legal thriller. Mm -hmm. And Jack Switek was has become a recurring character yes. in about twelve of the th twenty-three novels I've written. And uh, when I when the pardon first sold to Harper Collins, uh, who is still my publisher after twenty-three novels, I can remember sitting down with my uh, my editor for the first time in New York, and he looked at me and said, "Well, you know, so when is this you know legal thriller bubble gonna burst? You hmm. know, and this was nineteen ninety-three. He asked me that question, and um, you know, back then shows like uh, L.A. Law were just getting started. Well, L.A. Law was, had gained traction by then, but Law and Order was just getting started, uh, and there's just been uh, sort of this insatiable appetite for it. And one of the great things I think about that is that I think um, you know, readers now are more sophisticated about the law. They understand the basic what goes on in a courtroom, what to expect. As a writer, you don't have to explain all of that now. So you can make your stories a little more um, involved, complex, and multi-layered, and audiences aren't scratching their head and saying, oh, I, did, I missed that. Why, why, what just happened there? You know, True, so. but, and, and a lot of what goes on in the courtroom is frankly boring. Yeah. It, it, does, it takes a long time to get there. Yeah. You, I assume through your work you have drawn on cases that you have been a party to. Somewhat, you know, I would say I draw more on characters that I've met uh, in you a ever courtroom. Ever meet any you know, like so, that were in this book? Yeah, okay. actually I have, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the great thing about uh, being a trial lawyer is that, you know, you see people do courageous things like witnesses that will come forward when they really don't have a stake in it and they may even be threatened uh, or feel physically threatened and they, they do the right thing and they, and they testify. Um, and then you see people at their worst, you know, who you, you have, you know, oftentimes lawyer, you know, lawyers are accused of tricking somebody or, or, you know, tripping them up somehow. But, you know, I've been in sound involved, I've, I've confronted witnesses that the only way to get them to tell the truth is to trick them or, 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 or paint them into a corner or box them in. So you see people at your worst, too, as a trial lawyer. So I think all of that as I say, I wouldn't say that there's any case that I've sort of would say, oh, that that's this book is based on that case. But I could point to characters and say, well, that's based on this person I, I met through uh, this case or that trial. Well, speaking of characters, I have to say, uh, maybe it's me, but I really wanted things to work out for Reuben. Isn't that a terrible yeah. thing? I mean, yeah. he was a criminal, but the way you drew him, I, I understood him. Yeah, that's important, you know, because I think this isn't, um, uh, this could have easily, this isn't a book I don't think I could have written earlier in my career because I think I would have gotten caught up strictly in the what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And it, what makes a book like this work isn't just what happens next. It's actually caring about what happens next. And uh, and so the and and that's why it's 350 pages long instead of you know a 20 page uh, article in a, or, or short story or something because I want people to care about the characters and I want them to be thinking about the characters and thinking about issues of of uh, you know if you were Reuben's wife and suddenly you, f you find out your husband has seven million dollars buried behind the house in the patio <laughs> okay well you know bad boy Reuben you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, wow, it's really $7 million, you know? Yes, it's like, you know, and you know, she so. was a great character, yeah, so yeah, I, I, yeah. I want everyone yeah. to read it so they can find out what happens with her as well. Yeah. Speaking of what happens next, what does happen next? Another, I, I assume there will be book 24. Yeah, that's written already. Of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably, HarperCollins yeah. would have it no other way. Yeah, so that comes out March 1st. It's called Gone Again. Uh, and it's back in the series. You know, I've gotten away from the series a little bit. Um, Cash Landing is, has one of the characters, Andy Henning, the FBI agent, who's part of the Jack Switek series. 
Uh, that Cain, was clever. I, have, yeah, I liked how they yeah. took that. Yeah, and out. then Cain and Abe, it was before this, that had nothing to do with the Jack Switek series. So people who follow the series have been emailing me, what happens next, what happens next. So with Gone Again in March, they'll find out. Comes out in March. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And so number yeah. 24. Right, right. Wow. Yeah, working on 25 now, so... Yeah. You write every uh, single day, I guess, to be able to, to do this. You know, uh, when I was doing two books a year, yes. You know, um, Cain and Abe and Cash Landing came out within six months of each other. I'm backing off that pace a little bit and trying to enjoy it a little more. James Grafondo, this has been such fun for all of us. I want to thank you for Cash Landing. Loved it. Thank you for being a guest on Between the Covers today. My pleasure, anytime. Thank you. I'm Ann Bocock, and for more stories, please tune in to the next Between the Covers.